Good morning. You all look ready for action. And you're going to get it today. Thank you for joining us for the Faculty Lecture of the Year. This is a unique and important tradition. Very few community colleges take time off to hear from one of their own and think about new ideas as a community. But before we get started, out of respect for the speaker, your colleagues, and your colleagues, please turn off your cell phones, your smartphones, your tablets, your smartwatches, <laughs> anything else that makes noise. I'd like to welcome and thank board members for joining us. President Lee McDougall. <laughs> Katie Roberts, sitting next to Henry. And Gary Owens, sitting next to Kat. Because you are a smart and engaged group, I'm sure you'll want to join us for the discussion after the presentation. The discussion will take place at 11 in room 211, so it should be easy to remember. It's in the CAA building or Center for the Arts, which is, if you walk straight out the door, it's the three-story building, second floor, first classroom on the left. Excuse me. So I hope you will join Robin and the rest of us. To be chosen as Faculty Lecturer of the Year is the highest honor the faculty gives. It also honors this college and all of you who are passionate about learning. I think Robin fits that category pretty well, too. Many of Robin Nikita's early memories unfold outdoors in the solitary delight of a four-year-old catching fence lizards butterflies and worms, and climbing trees in what seemed like a huge double-level yard. All, all, although neither of her parents had degrees, they were deeply curious about nature. Both were supportive of Robin's strong desire to explore the natural world in ways that seemed bizarre and dangerous to them, like camping, backpacking, with mixed groups, no less, mixed gender groups, no less. Also, they couldn't understand the bizarre, the um, working with physically demanding work for weeks at a time, far from away from amenities. Following spotty performances in primary and most of secondary school, Robin was encouraged by her oldest sister, enticing stories about rich intellectual life at Chafee College. Eventually, Robin, her three sisters, and her mother all attended Chafee College. With her sister's guidance, she graduated from Upland High School a year early and made a beeline for Chafee. She was delighted to find challenging courses taught by Chafee professors with an unshakable belief in their students' abilities. These professors invested enormous thought and energy in support of students' training and thinking and the skills of their discipline. Robin's exposure to zoology and field biology at Chafee and the inviting humanistic attitudes of her professors met her own deep desire to pursue meaningful work that would take her into the outdoors. She decided that rather than training to become a medical missionary, she would ra much rather pursue biology and maybe a college teaching job. At age 23, Robin earned a master's degree in biology with much adventure along the way. She married her best pal, Mark, whom she got to know at Chafee, and they had a daughter, Dana. It was 1980, and there was no jobs for biologists in community colleges. So Robin landed her first full-time job as a high school teacher. She fell in love with high school students' energy, unvarnished honesty, and delightfully uneven minds. Well put. Um, Robin designed and taught the first advanced placement course at Ontario High School, where the prevailing attitude was such courses were too rigorous for these kids. These kids flourished and pass rates on the AP biology exam were high. Through the 17 years she taught at high school, Robin maintained her scholarship by keeping up with professional journals, pursuing her own field work, and taking her students on several overnight trips during the school year. In time, 18 years ago, Robin landed a teaching job at Chafee, fulfilling her dream of becoming a community college professor. 
She also misses high school students, and lo but loves college students dearly. She particularly appreciates the opportunity afforded by the college schedule to spend time to know students and do lots of meaningful work with them. Community College, Robin says, gives professors the privilege of working with a crucible of growth and positive impact. The work is terrifically rewarding and affords lots of opportunities for Robin to pay forward the gifts she was given at Chafee. They are inclusion, high expectations, inspiration, scholarly discipline, above all the ability to reflect all the best in students that they cannot yet see in themselves. Robin is immensely grateful to Chafee College for facilitating her efforts to Mark and Dana, both biologists, her sisters, and colleagues, for their support and for understanding how important this work is to her. Robin Ikeda. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So thank you, Arden, to faculty senate, faculty, staff, and students, administration and governing board, and most especially to faculty, staff, students, family and friends who had a role in making t today's event a reality, many of whom are here today. My heartfelt thanks to you all. Please, please feel welcome all to the discussion after the talk. I am most eager to hear your thoughts and to continue a conversation on the topics raised here and in the booklet for a long time to come. This is a view of the Earth from Earth's orbit, an image we will return to shortly. But first, let me relieve a bit of cognitive load I'm imposing on you. The Anthropocene? Oh. Ta-da. As you can see from this image of the north rim of the Grand Canyon, the geologic record is demarcated by the signatures of major events in Earth's history written on the rocks. Each stratum is given a name and identifies unique environmental conditions and events, the traces of which are visible at that time all around the globe. Earth scientists agree that the signature of humans' impacts, especially since the Industrial Revolution, identifies the Anthropocene epoch as distinct from any time before. As this image of Dubai suggests, the mark of industrial humanity's activities are so pervasive that the signature can be read anywhere on the planet and so durable that the signature will persist for as long as the Earth exists. My intellectual journey has been an exploration of the evolutionary and ecological journey of our species. The products of that exploration are communicated as secondary literature in the booklet that you'll receive on the way out, and the thumbnail of that journey is given in this talk. While the matters at hand are serious, there is much room for genuine hope all of which I convey to you with great love and care. Before returning to the Earth from Earth's orbit, let's start from a greater distance still. This is an image of the Earth from the Moon's orbit. As described by astronaut Pete Conrad, as a fragile sphere of dazzling beauty floating alone in a dangerous void. I want to underscore two points about this image. The first is the fragility of the planet. In this photo, we can appreciate the vast and uninhabitable void beyond our own planet. Second point is that there is no sign of strife played out across and within the borders, unseen beneath these clouds. The forces driving human conflict seem largely related to a point raised in the discussion after Mark Meyer's lecture last year. The racism is only part of a larger pattern of discriminatory behavior that seems to go well beyond race. It appears to be an intrinsic part of human nature. For the present, I will generally describe the human tendency towards strife as tribalism. So one focal point of my exploration became the question, why are we so tribal? I want to pause with this image, though, before returning to the Earth's orbit, because this talk is essentially about the struggle to internalize this perspective of the Earth in relationship to space and to ponder why doing so matters in this particular moment in our species' journey.
So we return again to the sunrise over the Pacific, taken from the Earth's orbit. The image gives you a sense of the biosphere, the layer of atmosphere, ocean, crust, and life that makes life on Earth possible. Think of your skin. It's only partly alive, but it's the barrier between you and the inhospitable environment around you that makes the continuation of your life possible. The biosphere is like that. It's the thin, partially living skin of the Earth which makes life on Earth as we know it possible. For more than a century, scientists have questioned the global sustainability of the human population, alerting us to the fact that our numbers and activities are damaging the biosphere. But their warnings have had little meaningful effect on individual behavior or upon public policy. So second necessary, necessary focal point of the talk became an exploration into what exactly is the ecological status of our, of our species on the Earth. Further, denial, stalling, and brinksmanship, all ring of tribalism. For example, when nations' negotiations on carbon emission standards amount to, we'll lower our emissions when you lower yours. So I've wondered whether the thinking processes behind some of such obstructive behaviors might be causally related to tribalism. But in any event, I wanted to better understand what makes us think that playing chicken over the health of the biosphere can possibly end well. So two questions aligned. What is our ecological status on the Earth? And how can we understand our tribal tendencies to form a third? Do our tribal tendencies imperil our ecological status on the Earth? And if so, how? Which suggests a fourth. How can we use our understanding to act in the interests of our collective future? We humans have lots of wonderful ways of learning and knowing things. I approach these questions using the tools of science, which look for falsifiable explanations for phenomena. In the next slide, we'll explore the uniqueness of science as a way of knowing. Now, faith is, well, my, let me, yeah. the writer of the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament asserts, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Knowing in this statement isn't contingent upon evidence, but upon belief, a central feature of which is a supernatural being. The approach is opposite to that taken in science because the goal of science is to look for natural explanations for phenomena, which we then attack, attempting to falsify them. We attack our explanations in science because we know that we love to believe certain things, especially we love to believe certain ideas, especially our own. So we really work hard to suspend belief in science. In Madame Bovary, Flaubert laments, human speech is like a cracked copper kettle upon which we drum crude rhythms for bears to dance to, while we long to make music that would melt the stars. The statement requires the hearer's imagination and experience and empathy. Such descriptions often inform scientific inquiry and they can aid in the communication of scientific ideas to public audiences, but they don't directly contribute to the methods of science. This is a line from a handout that emeritus professor Jim Delorier used with his Bio 1 students. If the things I see disagree with the things that I think, I must change what I think. The statement requires the opposite of the participant from the first. As discussed before, the speaker suspends belief in the pursuit of provisional ideas that are based solely upon the best available evidence. The exploration to follow is made scientifically. Starting with the first question then, what is our ecological status on the Earth? An organism's ecology is defined by its reciprocal interactions with its environment. Those feedbacks always involve exchanges of materials and energy. Consider, for example, your own dietary input and energetic and material outputs. Matter and energy are the domain of the physical sciences, so we'll look there to begin. You know the laws of thermodynamics already, or you wouldn't recognize that the candles are burning backwards. The wax is being broken down into carbon dioxide as the candle is burned, just as your own body burns carbs and fats and releases energy and carbon dioxide. The energy that was concentrated in the wax is now being released as heat and light, so the materials and energy continue to exist. They're just in different forms. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Matter and energy are neither created nor destroyed. As wax, the materials and energy are in a more concentrated form than they are than in the CO2, heat, and light present after the wax is burned. You know the times arrow 
follows from order to disorder. The things naturally fall apart because the law is a dominating force in your own life. And that's the second law of thermodynamics, that the disorder in a system will always increase. And these laws aren't only pervasive in your life, they apply to the universe as we know it. A paper published in the Proceedings of the American Academy of Sciences last summer used a familiar analogy to apply the laws of thermodynamics to the ecological status of our species. And we all use batteries, so it's a good analogy. The end at which the the end at which energy is concentrated is labeled positive in this battery, and the end to which energy will flow when there's a load on the battery is, is labeled negative. Earth's biosphere sustains processes that, can, can, that concentrate energy against the uninhabitable void of space, placing the Earth at the positive end. On the other, end, on the other hand, space contains very low energy and is unregulated and thus inhospitable, so it's at the negative end. We'll use a meter to quantify the energy sources upon which we most directly depend. That is, other species and their products, call that biomass, and accessible fossil fuels. The meter is set up to allow us to compare the Earth's charge in terms of those essential energies over time. So it turns out that as the processes, it turns out that the processes that make biomass, like photosynthesis, leave a robust signature in the fossil record. We know that the first photosynthetic cells, these little guys, were, converted, were converting sunlight and CO2 into biomass, the stuff of life, like carbs, proteins, and fats, by about three and a half billion years ago. So that means the Earth's space battery began its trickle charge way back then. Fast forward three billion years to when plants arose and invaded the land, about 500 million years ago, so about a half a billion years ago. In time, plant forms that could survive the stresses of terrestrial life covered substantial areas of land mass, converting vast quantities of carbon dioxide and light into biomass. By 350 million years ago, these ancient plants became so large and productive that when they died, their bodies didn't decay. They fossilized as coal oil, and natural gas, fossil fuels. But the peak period of fossil fuel formation that began 350 million years ago ended just 200 million years later when terrestrial fungi evolved the means to digest wood. So fossil fuel formation ended 150 million years ago and fossil fuels are non-renewable. Fast forward over 100 million years to 200,000 years ago when the first fully modern humans arose. Note first that the charge of the battery has not changed. Recall that the battery reached its peak charge 150 million years ago, after which time fossil fuel formation had ceased. By the time modern humans arose, there was a rich store of living biomass and fossil fuels biomass, fossil fuels. Our ancestors would have concentrated on the living biomass, that is, the organisms around them, and the products of those organisms, the net primary productivity, such as fruits picked from shrubs, eggs raided from nests, and fish snared from the water. In general, the Earth's primary productivity is what feeds all of life on Earth, and productivity depends entirely on live biomass, so the chemical energy and processes in the living biomass sustains a habitable biosphere away from the inhospitable conditions of space. Examples of the essential role of live biomass in, ma in maintaining a habitable biosphere are myriad. As another example, besides food, the ozone layer that protects life from UV radiation is formed from oxygen produced by photosynthesis. Early humans used fire to concentrate or expose prey, as this Australian bushman is doing, as well as for cooking and as a source of heat and light, thus putting a load on the battery and beginning the discharge of energy into space, forward to 10,000 BC and the dawn of agriculture 12,000 years ago. The agricultural way of life intensified the discharge of Earth's live biomass stores into space, by clearing of natural ecosystems for crops, herding, 
and human settlements. A trend that intensified into the period of the Roman Empire at 1 CE. So by 1900, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. The Earth's battery had sustained a loss of 34% in live biomass energy since 1 CE, and the discharge of fossil fuels had begun in earnest. This aerial view of Rancho Cucamonga demonstrates the typical landscape of modern industrialized countries. Living biomass has been replaced by an environment that is built to sustain one species, the operation of which is dependent upon the discharge of considerable fossil fuel. So that by the year 2000, Earth's live biomass store had been reduced to 46% of that present in 1 CE, and 25% of the 2000 year long discharge had occurred in just the 100 years between 1900 and 2000. Further, 1.3% of the accessible fossil fuel remaining in the year 2000 was used in the year 2000 in that single year. So pooling the lessons from the battery, we've discussed steep biomass reduction, live biomass reduction of 46% since 1 CE, with 25% of that of that 2,000 year trend occurring in the last 100 years and rapid expenditure of fossil fuels so rapidly that 1.3% of all remaining accessible fuels was used in the year 2000 alone. What, pro what about primary productivity? The annual productivity of the biosphere constitutes food for all species on Earth. We now preempt 40% of annual productivity to feed humans. In this analysis, that's worrisome because the functioning biosphere contains all of life. There are lots of processes like photosynthesis and pollination for which humans depend entirely on other organisms and that other organisms are much better at. For example, birds and bats are superior pest managers. And about 23% of the global annual energy expenditure is discharged simply to supply food to the global population of over 7 billion. The laws of thermodynamics are inviolable. Humans' present ecological status on the Earth is not thermodynamically sustainable. Let's consider the world's population size for a moment. The global population is estimated to have been about a half billion in 1 CE, at the time of the Roman Empire. Let's say then that it took 200,000 years since the dawn of modern humans to reach that first half billion. The population reached 1 billion in 1800, so it took only 1800 years for the population to double by half billion. By the time my grandma was born on April 20th, 1900, <laughs> I like the symmetry of that, the global population had already grown by another half billion reaching one and a half billion. By the time I was my granddaughter's age, in 1960, the population had reached three billion. In my grandma's first 60 years, the population had doubled, and she nearly lived long enough to see it double again, not by 1.5 billion this time, but by three billion, and in just 39 years. Rapidly quickening double time in the face of reductions in limiting resources, for example, biomass and fossil fuels, is a very serious matter. It is clear that there are too many of us and that we are using our resources too rapidly. The analysis is sobering. We need to seize the opening, though, to work the problem. There is considerable hope in the fact that we are the one species on the planet with the cognitive machinery to peer into the mirror of our own biology, both historical and present, and to try to understand what we are and how we have arrived where we are Indeed, the triumph and potential redemption of humanity is that we can ponder these realities of what we are at all. So how can we understand our tribal tendencies? This question will be considered from two perspectives, historical and physiological. A little physiology here. First, we'll consider the historical perspective which is informed principally by anthropology, evolutionary biology, and geography. 
Even more, even more than for most mammals of the same size, the evolutionary trajectory of modern humans, such as these Khoisan hunters in East Africa, is driven by the acquisition of resources. This image illustrates many aspects of the hunter-gatherer way of life our ancestors lived, even before fully modern humans arose. These men have developed technologies that increase their efficiency at, at acquiring resources, and their effort requires intense cooperation and, and skills that it took years to develop the latter of which implies a long period of dependency. Some proportion of the resources acquired are allocated to reproduction. Children develop slowly and require a long period of training, a task shared by an array of cooperative group members, largely kin. Early humans and their more recent ancestors typically lived in mixed generation groups of highly cooperative, interdependent individuals. This image of, a Cambodian, of Cambodian rice farmers demonstrates innovation taken way beyond tool use to the level of engineering of the very ecosystem. There are other ecosystem engineers in, nature's, in nature. Beavers are noteworthy examples. But no species takes ecosystem engineering to the level that humans do. For example, in this image, oxen and grains are domesticated and water flow is diverted to flood the paddy. The effort demands considerable cooperation and the innovation dramatically increases the group's access to resources. We thus find ourselves in this self-intensifying cycle in which the human tendency to innovate alters our ecology. It alters the way we interact with our environment, such that we squeeze out more resources, at least in the short term. These resources are turned into offspring, which increase consumption and resources, which increase consumption of resources, leveraging greater advantage to innovators, and so on. The cycle appears to be ancient, beginning in earnest well before our species arose, and it appears to have developed exponentially. The imperative for increasingly large groups of people to gain access to a maximum of resources at minimum cost can easily lead to conflict, such as in these New Guinean tribesmen who are preparing for warfare with another tribe. At such times, we systematically dehumanize people of other groups, creating a psychological opening that allows us to usurp their resources and plunder their possessions, and in the case of slavery, even their very bodies. It seems that there is a duality to the human character that is driven by in-group cooperation and out-group conflict, played out in the evolutionary histories we all share. We now, we now make a transition inward to explore the basis of in-group cooperation and out-group conflict using the work of cognitive neuroscientists, psychologists, sociologists, and evolutionary biologists. Cognitive neuroscientists use lots of powerful tools to explore the forces that drive thought and behavior. Among them are scenarios like this trolley dilemma that Vera Dunwoody described in her talk about how the physiology of our brains shapes our perceptions of reality. The trolley dilemma confronts subjects with a hypothetical scenario, all outcomes of which will be fatal, either for one person or for five people. In one scenario, A, the subject would only have to flip a switch, sacrificing one person to prevent the other five people, to prevent five other people from death by runaway trolley. By contrast, another scenario, B, requires the subject push the person whose life is being sacrificed to stop the trolley, saving the, remember, the remaining five people. While the large majority of subjects will flip the switch in A, relatively few subjects say they would actively push to their death a person on the bridge, even to save the five people on the tracks. They can't really explain why. They report that it just feels wrong. As Vera Dunwoody explained in her lecture, brain imaging by functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, shows that those choices are made pre-consciously in a brain region called the anterior insula. If you point to either side of your skull, just above your jaw joint, and imagine that the, the area of your brain is about an inch or so deep from either fingertip, you're imagining the posi positions of your two insulas. Well, it turns out that the activities of your insulas are highly prejudicial. So for example, a study conducted in the Netherlands found that the results of the more active or B variation in the trolley dilemma depend upon the subject's perceptions of the person on the bridge. If a person on the bridge had a name indicating membership in the subject's in-group, in this case Dutch, the subject was significantly less likely to suggest to, to select the option to push the person, thereby protecting their in-group member. But if the person had a name indicating membership in the subject's out-group, 
German or Arab in this case, the subject was significantly more likely to select the option of pushing him off the bridge, a demonstration of outgroup derogation. This and other studies like it demonstrate that we have a strong in-group and out-group identities, that these identities significantly and unconsciously bias our judgments about how to treat one another, and that these biases are in turn driven by the activities of a specific identifiable regions in our brains. The insula is one example of such a brain region. Furthermore, neuroscientists and other biologists are also uncovering how our body chemistry impacts the activities of these brain regions. For example, in that study from the Netherlands, those folks also revealed that the selections made were sensitive to the influence of a hormone called oxytocin, which all of us have floating around in our bloodstreams and brains right now. That squiggly thing is a molecular model of the hormone. The researchers knew that administering oxytocin through a nasal spray sends the hormone directly to your brain. So they had subjects self-administer a nasal spray that either contained oxytocin or a saline solution as a control. As expected, the saline solution had no impact on the results I described before. The subjects still pr protected perceived in-group members and more freely sacrificed perceived out-group members. But under the influence of oxytocin, subjects' choices of both in-group protection and out-group sacrifice intensified significantly. So the person on the bridge was the least likely to be actively sacrificed if he had a Dutch name and the subject had taken oxytocin. Conversely, the person on the bridge was the most likely to be sacrificed if he had a German or Arab name and the subject had taken oxytocin. So we know that oxytocin is a hormone that is found in our blood and brains and that, our impacts, and that it impacts our judgments about how to treat one another. Further, its impact is strongly influenced by our genetics, both in terms of our manufacture of oxytocin, some of us make more oxytocin than others, and our sensitivity to the oxytocin we make. Some of us are more sensitive to oxytocin than others. Molecular models of oxytocin are making their way into cultural iconography, showing up in tattoos and jewelry, for example, as the scientific discoveries about its role in our lives diffuses into popular culture. Part of oxytocin's reputation as the love hormone appears to be richly deserved. Neurobiologists have discovered that oxytocin promotes bonding between family members, particularly between children and their grandparents. This is my daughter Dana with her grandfather Johnny Ketta to illustrate the point. Indeed, oxytocin in, in, enhances social bonding in general by promoting the empathy and trust that enable it. But we have also seen that oxytocin promotes outgroup derogation. And part of Johnny Ketta's story serves as a potent reminder of the real power of such derogation. John was a typical American schoolboy of nearly 15, living with his family in Los Angeles on the day that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Within two weeks, the family had been uprooted, leaving their life in Los Angeles behind. They stayed in converted stalls at the Santa Anita Raceway until they were transported by train to the Amachi concentration camp in Colorado. John was confined there until, in a bitter irony, he was drafted to protect the freedom of a country that had denied him his and for no better reason than because his face looked like that of the enemy. Many people share such stories. We know that many such stories are played out as we consider these realities. So I want to pause here to reflect upon the criteria that emerge from the in-group, out-group examples we've explored. Let's take a drink. as well as those that we see playing out across the world and throughout history. Race was a clear factor in the Japanese internment dur during World War II, but the parsing of group identities demonstrated by subjects in the trolley studies from the Netherlands was driven by ethnocentrism, maybe nationalism. It appears that the wars in the Middle East are largely fueled by sectarianism, and that ethnocentrism was a key driver defining Union and Confederate affinities in our own civil war. My point is that there appears to be a larger force at work in our natures, with, which I've been collectively referring to as tribalism. Lots of neurobiologists, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, and evolutionary biologists are working hard to understand how we came to be so tribal, how our tribal tendencies d 
develop over our lifetimes and how the structure and physiology of our brains drives our tribal tendencies. They are discovering that our tribalism is malleable and those insights are helping us begin to understand how to train our tribal brains. For example, consider a powerful set of experiments in which subjects witness the simulated administration of painful stimuli to a person from a group about which the subject has expressed outgroup derogation. Typical outgroups are rival teams or races. Experimenters can monitor a range of subjects' responses, such as the activity of their brain's empathy and pleasure centers and the activity of their smiling muscles. Experimenters consistently find that with no intervention, subjects' empathy centers are quiet, whereas their pleasure centers and smiling muscles are active. These responses are both common and are often entirely subconscious. Typical interventions include having subjects fulfill a task or even simply talk with a member of the perceived outgroup. When the simulated painful stimulus is repeated, the subject's response is no longer signal pleasure, but rather empathy. So we've examined the present ecological status of our species, and we understand some of the forces in human nature that drive us to be so consumptive and to see others as different and less worthy of regard. Now let's address the question, do our tribal tendencies imperil our ecological status on Earth, and if so, how? The answer to the first part of the question is yes. Our, tribal tendence, our tribalism appears to be part of a network of hair trigger reacting. It seems that this network served our ancestors really well. However, it seems to set us up to struggle when making the decisions that modern life demands of us. Let's first explore how our hair trigger reaction network compromises our decision making. We will then have the tools to consider some informed brain training later. Let's look at the facts. It is a conspiracy. Why do, we react to recent, why do we react to some ideas as if a rival is coming at us with a club? Here's what we're beginning to understand. Both implicit trust and motivated reasoning are emotional, intuitive, and subconscious. When you got out of bed this morning, you didn't pause to question whether the floor would support you. Your trust in the supported function of floors is implicit relieving you of the cognitive burden of testing every floor you want to stand on. Implicit trust gives us confidence in the everyday action of our lives. And because implicit trust is subconscious, we are only aware of the feelings of confidence and security in objects, people, and institutions we gain from it when those bonds of trust are disrupted. And that is very uncomfortable. Until fairly recently in our evolutionary history, such disruptions would have signaled the immediate threat of predation whether human or otherwise. Our physiological response is to being confronted with the idea that challenges our implicit trust in some way, such as our in-group identity or our access to resources, are identical to the fight or flight response evoked by a predator. Modern humans most commonly respond to disruptions in their implicit trust systems with some form of motivated reasoning, that is, thinking that is directed towards some need or some goal. Since I have learned about motivated reasoning, I see it everywhere especially in my own thinking. It's impactful. It's, an, it's a highly impactful human foible, and figuring out how to think our way through it carries high stakes for the future of our species. I will thus illustrate with a recent example from my own experience. So a couple of weeks ago, I was grading 38 essay exams for my evolutionary ecology students. I was pretty proud of the efficacy of the exam as a tool to, act, to assess some specific kinds of thinking and communication skills we'd been working on. So I was happy to begin the task of reading the students' responses. And indeed, there were questions on which the students' performances were superb. But there was one question that it, looks like, that it looked like no one was going to get entirely. As I read the exams, I was thinking open-mindedly about aspects of the question that were unclear, as well as aspects of the instruction, which probably accounted for the students' inability to make the synthesis I'd expected. And then, near the end of the pile, one student did. I felt my uncertainty about the question dissolve into a comforting glow of self-satisfaction. <laughs> I can't count the number of times in my career I've drunk that Kool-Aid. <laughs> that particular flavor of motivated reasoning is called cherry-picking the data. <laughs> Thanks to my discovery of the work around motivated reasoning, I was able to maintain a more realistic perspective of mine and my students' performances. I have unconscious, 
implicit trust in my teaching methods and in my group and in my in-group identity. And my in-group identity is partially tied to seeing myself as a capable teacher, both of which make me susceptible to giving undue credence to data in support of those views and undue skepticism to data that refute them. I also accept, largely unconsciously, a, constell a constellation of beliefs and ideals I think strong teachers hold, call that the teacher ideology. Along with implicit trust and in-group identity, ideology com completes the cocktail of processes that appear to drive motivated reasoning. So what's the big deal? It's now possible to see how our tribalism distorts our decision-making about our ecology. People living in wealthy countries have what the literature calls an existential sense, an existential experience of security. In other words, we have implicit trust in our access to food, in our access to water, and in our access to fuel. And we expect to be safe. Those are simply the terms of our existence in our view. Learning otherwise, that restricted water use is required in the face of drought, for example, will predictably trigger forms of motivated reasoning such as denial. Before moving from regional to national and global examples, it will be helpful to put these ideas together with our own brain and oxytocin work. And for that, we will need a brain. Here you have an image of a human brain and much of its structural glory. It is complicated, especially if you're reading the neurobiology literature. But the literature about brain and behavior boils it all down for us with lots of helpful discussion about top-down and bottom-up thinking. So I'll frame the brain that way too. Top, middle, bottom. On the bottom, deep within the brain are a number of interacting centers forming a network called the limbic system, the amygdala. We all have a pair of them, are the most famous of these structures. In the middle, we have processing centers, such as the insula, with which the limbic system communicates. At the top of the brain, is the cerebral cortex. And for the purposes of thinking, we're only concerned with the prefrontal cortex, this part here, not here, just this. So top, middle, and bottom. And what do they have to do with our story? To put it briefly, the limbic system is the emotional network. The limbic system and processing systems working together are where we build and deploy our implicit trust, our ideologies, and our motivated reasoning, all of which are subconscious. When we're operating from this brain space, which we commonly do, we're doing what cognitive psychologists call bottom-up thinking. Recall the trolley experiments and the pain infliction experiments. On the other hand, the work of the prefrontal cortex is largely conscious, as the prefrontal cortex is active in self-regulation and in being intentional. It, too, is connected with the limbic system and processing centers, and it is influenced by oxytocin. In the prefrontal cortex, oxytocin en enhances our awareness of our own and others' thinking processes, forming the foundation for empathy and the kind of trust we have to work for, explicit trust. The interventions used in the pain infliction experiment activated the subject's prefrontal cortexes. Remember that line from Jim Delorier's handout? If the things I see disagree with the things that I think, I have to change what I think. Now there is work going on to develop explicit trust and to circumvent motivated reasoning. Explicit trust is thoughtful, rational, and evaluative. It is based on the weighing of evidence and experience, and it takes considerable cognitive effort. Such work forms the cornerstone of critical thinking. Cognitive psychologists call this top-down thinking. We have much work to do in our top-down thinking. Consider, a recent, consider the recent work by the Pew Research Organization. Researchers measured concern about climate change in people over most of the globe. The mean score for each country is plotted against its per capita emissions in 2011. People in countries with low carbon emissions are typically the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Although their practices are not the major source of the problem, they are the most concerned. Those of us in countries with the highest emissions whose practices cause global warming 
are the least concerned. The paradox is startling, and the denial is baffling, unless you understand motivated reasoning. Recall that modern studies in developed countries, modern societies in developed countries, enjoy an experience of existential security. As we saw in the battery analysis, that sense of security is not sustainable because it exists as a direct result of a web of carbon intensive and biomass consumptive practices. Our implicit trust in the practices that have led to the sustained prosperity of our existence like food production and distribution and the systems that underpin them, such as individual, such as individual freedom, democracy, and capitalism, are disrupted by scientific predictions of widespread environmental change. The fingerprint of motivated reasoning driving our collective responses to the science of our ecology is revealed in the next data set, data set from the Pew organization as well. It would take five verse to support the human population at the standard of living enjoyed by an average American for one year, and yet only 59% of Americans think that the growing world population will be a problem in the future. The resonance with the prior exploration of tribalism, group affiliation, implicit trust, and motivated reasoning. The Pew Research Organization also found that our views on climate and the environment and population all correlate strongly with our religious and political beliefs. We now understand that some of our religious and political ideologies, beautiful, valuable, indispensable, and noble though they may be in some respects, are subconsciously driving behaviors which threaten our future existence and the functional integrity of the biosphere itself. The disruption of implicit trust in our practices, the systems that underpin them, and even our ideologies is deeply and profoundly troubling. Denial and other forms of motivated reasoning, which lead to the stalling and brinksmanship I referred to at the opening of the talk, are common responses. But they are the product of the kind of bottom-up thinking we can no longer afford. In the Anthropocene epic, we must learn to face the disruption of our implicit trust systems explicitly. The question is then, can we find our way to a sense of ourselves we can live with because the laws of thermodynamics don't care whether we're offended, nor whether we are uncomfortable, nor whether we are confused. Our daily lives are lived in a bubble of culture, relationship, and associated identities without an explicit awareness of the realities that support them. That is, the universal relationships between matter and energy. Working toward a public understanding about these thermodynamic relationships seems to me a very strong start in the right direction. Besides being entropy machines, as Mark Meyer likes to call humans, we now know that we can be brutal and cruel, that we can fool ourselves into thinking that is it appropriate to be so. We know that fear of the unknown triggers this response, and we know that we can control ourselves in the face of our fears, that we can be courageous. We know the incredible generosity and selflessness that spring from in-group identity and that we can leverage our courage to consciously broaden our in-group. Kathy Brindell's 1996 faculty lecture about Europeans who in the, in, at great peril to themselves sheltered, sheltered Jews during the Holocaust dramatically underscored the enormity of courage and generosity we humans are capable of. So we step with confidence to the final question of this talk. How can we use our understanding to act in the interests of our collective futures? What is actionable for us here? There is much we can do, especially now that we are beginning to understand our psychological barriers to change and how to surmount them. The most critical intervention is the immediate reduction of the growth of the global population, the most di direct means for which is the lowering of birth rates. In general, Increasing the quality of life, particularly for women, dramatically lowers birth rates. I've compiled thumbnails of the whole collection of interventions known to reduce population birth rates in a single slide, conspicuously violating the rule of six, so that we can appreciate how interventions in several areas can leverage improvements in others. 40% of pregnancies worldwide in 2012 were unintended. So addressing the unmet need for contraception would dramatically lower birth rates. Educational access, especially for girls, correlates strongly with delayed reproduction and lowered birth rates. Further, both education and gender equity improve women's access to money. Since birth rates plummet dramatically when women have control over even small amounts of money, 
Education and gender equity have compounding effects upon reducing birth rates. Healthcare and clean water both increase longevity and dramatically reduce infant mortality. Women who are confident that their children will survive, we know that they desire to have fewer children and birth rates go down. Increasing social equity is necessary to create the stable socio-political conditions that make the reduction of birth rates possible. But reducing birth rates have impacts on populations that must be managed for the long-term result to be positive and durable. For example, for more than a generation, China had restricted population growth by limiting couples to one child. But just last summer, China rescinded the policy due to an economic downturn that was driven in part by the paucity of workers. Greece and Italy and Japan are in similar predicament as are many other countries. Well, why? The answer has to do with the impact of lower birth rates on the age structure of a population as it ages through two or three generations. So here's a quick primer about age structure. The percent of population is graphed on the x-axis and on the y-axis is age or year born. And the graphs are split by gender, male and female. Populations with rapid growth have higher birth rates and higher mortality and more of a pyramid shaped. Lower birth rates result in a disproportionately smaller number of youngsters. So the age structure of a slowly growing population is more tower-like and the age structure of a declining population has a narrow base. Due to its low birth rates, there are relatively few small children. So as a population in decline ages, there will be a generation or two in which there are fewer workers supporting more elderly and retired folks. Well, it's evidently possible to plan for this demographic shift by structuring the economy to sustain it. However, our institutions, our governments, our economies, and our banks are generally disengaged from the global resource and population crisis, so the appropriate planning doesn't happen. Further, the expectation that economies must grow, driven by an ever-increasing demand for workers, and the population growth that sustains that demand is a current example of the enormous gap between public policy and a clear understanding of a thermodynamic system outside of the bubble of culture. The expectation of unlimited economic and population growth underscores the pervasive role of implicit bias and motivated reasoning in our institutions. So there is much work to do in support of the more intentional, explicit operation of these institutions. An analysis of the relationship between access to energy and quality of life is another important piece. The Human Development Index measures quality of life and the met using matrices that include wealth, access to education, and health, like lifespan and infant mortality. HCI is plotted against annual electricity use, 82% 80, of which last year was from fossil fuels. You see three points for China because the population is so large and so stratified that each point has to represent a different stratum. The graph shows that although modern, although modern technological industrial societies represent a relatively small proportion of the Earth's global population, they are disproportionately responsible for the unsustainable discharge of the Earth's battery into space, but with no benefit to their quality of life. So notice that it's pretty flat here over this large range of energy use. There is thus a tremendous opportunity to lower energy use and thereby carbon emissions by finding ways to slide these countries to the left of the graph without even lowering anyone's quality of life. The equity issue here is rather conspicuous. Global population and energy experts have calculated a sweet spot of quality of life and energy use that is more ethical and sustainable than the distribution that we have now. Note the quality of life matrices, and also note the quality of life matrices resonate with factors known to reduce birth rates. We thus can expect birth rates to decline rapidly in countries with low quality of life once they are lifted by access to more resources into a higher quality of life. It was clear from the battery analysis that we would be well advised to preserve remaining live biomass and to restore as much as possible. In addition, greater gender equity 
is associated with more sustainable use of resources insofar as the influence of women on decision making correlates strongly with more sustainable practices. Just saying. <laughs> the laws of thermodynamics will force changes in our ways of life, whether we wish it or not. We can preserve some choices over those changes if we recognize that ideologies are biologically driven, that they play out in our decision making and behaviors subconsciously. By supporting expanded multidisciplinary study in this area of human behavior, we can learn better how to control the forces of our ideologies and motivated reasonings. We can even learn to leverage them for the collective good, for example, by creating less consumptive cultural norms rather than allowing our ideologies to drive us. We can learn to become conscious of our motivated reasoning and become intentional about holding our deeply held beliefs in abeyance as we carefully consider opposing views. In fact, we can consciously seek opposing views simply to challenge our own and to de or excuse me, simply to challenge our own and to humanize those we would other be inclined to dehumanize. To accept that human population growth is out of control at the moment and that humans are seriously damaging the biosphere is deeply perplexing. It requires us to question our, our implicit trust in the systems that undergird every aspect of our lives. Unless we opt out by giving in to denial, such questioning further requires us to invest thoughtful consideration to the restructuring our li of our lives and of the systems within our society that support them. Of course, that is a tall order. But it isn't that much different from the stock in trade of a college professor. I think that we are uniquely well suited for our part in the global challenge because the disruption of implicit trust is also known as critical thinking. We educators routinely create cognitive dissonance in our students, supporting the formative thinking and insightful learning that arises from students' struggles to test what they had never before recognized they trusted implicitly. We, we inspire students to bend in the winds of doubt as they restructure new provisional ways of thinking. There is considerable promise in the pursuit of interventions that reduce and control prejudicial and stereotypic thinking and biased behaviors and that promote empathy. Classrooms led by diverse and culturally competent faculty are a powerful vessel for exactly that work. As an institution and a profession, the deepest purpose of our labor is to promote equity in our society. That education and equity are central to the amelioration of the global population crisis and endows we edu educators with a critical role to play. Chafee College invests enormous effort in the cultivation of meaningful inclusion, inviting and supporting all comers and then guiding students to a grasp of the world that fosters the development of richly informed and divergent thinking. We are privileged to work in an institution with such lofty aspirations. We thus have the opportunity, and I think it's a responsibility, to lean hard into expanding and deepening the, that work in the college. Because creating inclusion and resilience in people improves the resilience of the local and global systems in which those people live. On a larger scale, we can pay forward the benefits of our relative privilege by focusing an attentive gaze and determined action beyond the scale of our local immediately, immediate concerns to those of the global population and to the planet itself, the stuff of which we all are. Indeed, the thermodynamic requirements of our lives utterly depend upon a largely unseen web of life and materials in and around us. What occurs to us to do at this moment depends upon which world we think we live in, the familiar microscopic world of culture or this photograph. It also depends, well, or the world in this photograph. It also depends upon what we think we are. We know this much. Our answers have impacts on many lives. Those impacts will be felt both immediately and in the future, and they will be written in the rocks of ages. Thank you. Thank you.
so much. <laughs> oh, wow, that's so cool. We also are presenting a plaque to Robin, and we're and I'm sure, Robin, we'd like to encourage you to join the discussion. Everyone. It was hardly possible to have a more important discussion, I think. So I encourage you at 11 o'clock to be in the CEA building, which is just right out the door on the second floor. Let's hear it one more time for Robin. <laughs> Thank you for coming.